had a uh, real neat opportunity to do a uh, panel with Richard Branson uh, from Virgin Media uh, earlier this year. Uh, Richard uh, was over in the United States uh, touting uh, uh, formerly e-cars. Um, so uh, formerly e-racing, we actually had, uh, did this session at a formula E um, racing event uh, in the streets of Miami. So it's Formula One racing, but the E means it's electric cars. So it was fueled by seaweed. Um, fundamentally, the fuel that we had to drink the seaweed on there uh, it was horrible. Uh, I would encourage you not to drink uh, the, the seaweed fuel. Uh, but um, but it, you know, this, this alternative fuel um, being a piece of some of the changes that might um, be disruptive technology as we move forward in uh, in the uh, you know in the next uh, fifty years, next twenty years, um, automated vehicles, you uh, uh, completely autonomous vehicles. You hear people talking about them coming as soon as twenty eighteen. We're only in twenty fifteen, um, or uh, you know maybe as long as twenty thirty. But the truth of the matter is, I suspect you're going to see some real progressive cities in the United States be the first ones to experiment with this kind of stuff. But a fully autonomous car, imagine calling Uber and ordering up your car and it arrives to put in the driver. Right. Um, just to put this in perspective, self-driving cars, and this is just some of the statistics that are out self-driving cars are viewed as uh, possibly being able to reduce 90% um, of the U.S. auto accidents preventing $190 billion of damages and health costs annually and saving thousands of lives. Um, by the way, that's in the United States. Um, the situation in terms of deaths and injuries per driver in the United States is dwarfed by that of what happens in Asia, uh, which is multiple times um, that level, just to give you a perspective of how it changed the landscape and the global landscape. Um, Google. Um, many of you are familiar with Google Maps, and they've got their autonomous vehicles. You know, did you know that Google's got 23 autonomous vehicles that have traveled over 1.7 million miles? Um, they've actually had 14 minor injuries, um, and by the way, 11 times the Google car has been rear-ended um, by a human being. Um, so around um, those uh, 1.7 million miles, uh, none of those uh, 14 uh, minor injuries accidents were, uh, were caused by the Google system. So it just gives you a perspective. This is happening. It's happening for real. I don't know how many miles you've driven, but you know, driving 1.7 million miles and having 14 minor incidents uh, you know, really not a bad track record. Um, <coughs> Delphi, um, <coughs> back in March, launched a vehicle from the Golden Gate Bridge to New York City. They wanted it to arrive in uh, Manhattan in time for the, uh, uh, the New York Auto Show. Um, the, uh, the vehicle was the first one to travel um, 3,400 miles across the country. Um, it visited uh, 15 states um, and, uh, and the uh, District of Columbia uh, en route. And uh, it made it successfully 99% of the driving in that vehicle across those uh, 3,400 miles uh, was done uh, unaided um, by, uh, by computers. So it just gives you a perspective. I wanted to show you a quick video about that. It's a little relevant to uh, our geometry. It's day five. We arrived last night in Dallas. The engineers go through a logic and uh, refresh how the, the computer systems are, are working. It's all going as expected. We'll refresh the team with new uh, engineers from Silicon Valley. We'll stop in three hours in uh, Kilgarn and we do a quick checkup on the vehicle. So we're in Kilgore, Texas. It has sensors. Well, you can say y'all came through Kilgore, Texas, just so I could see this car on my birthday. So I think that's I think that's 
particularly neat, by the way, it's a, um, uh, it's not even an automobile manufacturer. They, they manufacture what goes into the automobile, um, and uh, they're out there testing <laughs> technology that's going to really drive where we're headed with autonomous vehicles. In general, think about it this way, go back to what I said, if you can reduce the number of accidents by 90%, because, by the way, most of accidents that happen are an accident caused by human error, by operator error, who are the operators and human beings. And if you can take that out of there, um, you can have a much safer uh, place. There's some great things that can happen. But does it mean that there will never be accidents? Does it never mean that there will never be a problem that requires insurance? The answer to that is absolutely not. It just means that the face of risk will change dramatically. Um, I'm not sure if any of you had a chance to see this or this really caught your eye. But the, you know, think about this. Your car arrives and there's no driver. How many of you start to say, I sure hope it's got proper cyber protection and that someone can't get control of that vehicle autonomously, you know, or, or uh, separately and actually drive it off the road where there's no one there to protect it? Did you know uh, that there, we had the, uh, the first auto recall um, in the United States, actually, I believe in the world um, recently? Did anybody know who it was? Uh, it was Jeep, yeah. And uh, so two researchers were able to successfully take control of a Jeep that was going down the road. Um, this is very recent. It was only recalled uh, within the last month. Uh, and uh, you, know, you imagine the complexity of what's going on as uh, we start to head toward an environment where we might have autonomous vehicles which would be much safer. But does it mean that we won't have risk? No, we'll have risk. The risk will just take a different form than the risk took before. And, and insurers have to be able to solve for how do we get our head around that risk? How do we think about the changing landscape of risk? How should we respond to that risk? And how can we help to make the world even safer from that? Those are the kinds of things that we are focused on day after day after day.